warning bells will be rung five minutes before the curtain goes up. One finds those words uh, written in the foyer of opera houses, and it happens in history too. In 1912, a complete symbol of material prosperity, the Titanic, struck an iceberg and sank. It was the prelude to the far greater disaster which came in 1914. Halfway through the 18th century, it must have seemed that the age of reason was equally indestructible. The great irrationals, sex, religion, fear, all comfortably under control. Then, in 1755, came the Lisbon earthquake. Never before, said the poet Goethe, has the demon of fear so quickly and powerfully spread panic through the land. Once more, there were grounds for belief in the wrath of God, or, alternatively, it was difficult to deny the existence of evil. And from that moment began a movement in all the arts painting, literature, architecture, and finally music, which lasted for over a century. I will call it the Romantic Rebellion. I'm going to talk about the way the Romantic Rebellion affected painting. And I must begin by looking at the kind of painting which it set out to destroy and to replace classic painting. The subjects of classic painting were drawn from those episodes in antique history or poetry that pointed a moral, chiefly acts of patriotism or self-sacrifice. And the style involved selecting from nature those elements that were smooth, unemphatic, and capable of generalization. It was the world of reason and decorum. Romantic art appealed to the emotions, in particular the emotion of fear and the exhilaration aroused by storm, bloodshed and ferocity. It was prepared to use any means to heighten the emotional effect of a picture, strong color, violent contrasts of light and shade, and a positive delight in the exaggerated movement that the theorists of classical art deplored. As a matter of fact, the first man to rebel against the vapid classicism of the theorists was himself a classic artist, Jacques-Louis David. He rebelled because he believed that painting did not exist to please the connoisseur, but to promote virtue. His first great effort to do so is in a picture where the subject is drawn from the moralizing historian of antiquity, Plutarch. It represents the oath sworn by three brothers, the Horatii. It was painted in Rome in 1785, and when it was exhibited, the crowds who visited it strewed in front of it a carpet of flowers. Suddenly, through a work of art, men became conscious of moral responsibility. You know, the artist who succeeds in influencing events leaves the free world of contemplation for the limited world of action. And very soon he finds that he must give up art for politics. David became a member of the convention. He voted for the death of the king. And he produced one masterpiece, the death of Marat, the Marat Assassine, which is, to my mind, the greatest political picture ever painted. It's the supreme and almost the only justification of the popular belief that an event which has aroused public emotion may immediately become the subject of a work of art. This is a triumph for the classic discipline. David, who was in the habit of pondering every detail, has had to paint with great speed. Yet the whole design has an air of concentration and finality, which is usually the result of prolonged elimination. David's classical training has also enabled him to strike a perfect bargain with the ideal. The figure, no less than the wooden box and the trompe papers, give the impression of perfect truth, and yet we know 
that Mara's face and body were ravaged by disease which David dared not represent. It is a deeply moving picture. In its emotional impact, much more part of the Romantic Rebellion than of Classicism. David shows that inside every classic artist of real greatness, there is a romantic struggling to be free. When did the real romantic spirit first show itself? Well, one answer is 1756, when Burke wrote an original and extremely boring work entitled An Inquiry into the Origins of the Sublime. It's based on the proposition that whatsoever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, is a source of the sublime. From which Burke deduces the sublime effect of darkness or destructive power, of solitude and silence, and the roaring of animals. But although this year, 1756, is as defensible as any date of the kind can be, an extraordinary prelude to the Romantic movement and to the imagery of fear had taken place in the preceding decade. The series of etchings known as the Carceri d'Invenzione, the Imaginary Prisons, by Gian Battista Piranesi. Piranesi is an example of the well-known paradox of history that cultures are destroyed from within. He was the arch fifth columnist of the 18th century. He was born in Venice, the city of pleasure. He lived in Rome, where he became the leading authority on classical antiquities. But he saw the ruins of ancient Rome not as, as picturesque, but as terrifying. And as early as 1745, he began to imagine them as prisons. His etchings have the quality of hallucination which may in fact have been induced by the use of opium. They are works of incredible technical skill. But that alone wouldn't have given them their power over us. The fears and frustrations of Piranesi's prisons are common to us all. And we recognize that authenticity immediately. You must go up those stairs to obtain your permit, and then take it over to those little round towers to be stamped. But uh, unfortunately, this office is closed and you're instructed to go up to the top gallery, but in doing so, you've taken a wrong turning and have infringed the regulations, so you must come down again and visit the office of the security officer who lives in this room. Well, of course, Piranesi couldn't possibly have foreseen the advantages of a well-organized state. But like all great artists, his work gives a fresh message to different ages. He fascinated the men of the late 18th century in whom the Lisbon earthquake had, in Goethe's phrase, released the demon of fear. He spoke directly to the age of Coleridge and De Quincey, and he still speaks compulsively to the age of Kafka. Fifty years after Piranesi had imagined his prisons, a far more famous artist had begun to paint his scenes of torture and imprisonment, Francesco Goya. One tends to forget him in thinking about the Romantic Rebellion, partly because he's such an individual artist and so much a genius that perhaps we shouldn't think of him as belonging to any movement. And partly because the tapestry designs that brought him fame are charming decorations in the 18th century style, with only an occasional hint of evil. However, the fact remains that almost every element in what I may call the iconography of Romanticism was used by Goya. Giants, here's one of them, causing a panic like King Kong. Witches, tortures, assassinations, the whole works. But used, of course, with incomparably greater skill and imaginative power than the horror comic novelists of the early 19th century. He was the most fashionable portrait painter, the darling of Spanish society, and the acknowledged lover of the brightest ornament, the Duchess of Alba. They forgave him everything, and I dare say there was a good deal to forgive. As you can see from his self-portrait, he was a little tough, a little Spanish bull. Up to the age of 40, Goya had a glorious time. 
Then, in 1792, he had a mysterious illness. We don't know what it was, presumably a form of syphilis. We know that he thought he'd brought it on himself. It knocked him out for about a year, and at the end of it, he was deaf. Not just hard of hearing, like Reynolds, or gradually losing his hearing, like Beethoven, but suddenly stone deaf. This man, who had been in the thick of life, was suddenly cut off from it. For some reason, human beings without their voices became for him grotesque and revolting. The solitude of his deafness was invaded by horrible monsters, and in the next few years he began the series of etchings which he described by the same word as Piranesi has used for his prisons, caprices. We call them by the Spanish equivalent, caprichos. They were published in the last year of the century of reason. In 1808, a second crisis took place in Goya's life, and also in history of Spain. The king abdicated, and Napoleon sent his armies to take over. Well, we all know what an occupying army means. When Goya saw how the soldiers behaved, wanton destruction, ruthless butchery, his Spanish patriotism, or sympathy for ordinary human beings, reasserted itself, and he left a record of the French occupation which is the most terrible and damning indictment of human cruelty ever made. In saying that, I'm not forgetting the films made since the last war. But far more important than these etchings, which are perhaps too much propaganda pieces, is a picture of a firing squad known as the 3rd of May, 1808. And personally, I think it's the greatest picture Goya ever painted. It is completely original. The first time in the history of art that a painter has seemed to make a direct transcript of an actual scene into a great work of art. It seems to have been done from one blinding flash of memory. As a matter of fact, it was painted about six years after the event. It is not the record of a single episode, but a grim reflection on the whole nature of power. In 1819, when he was 73, Goya brought himself a house near Madrid, the house of the deaf man, it was called, and decorated it according to his fancy. The canvases are in the Prado, in the next room to the tapestry designs. You pass from a picture like this enchanting vision of happy, fruitful life to this picture of Saturn devouring one of his children, which Goya had in his dining room. Goya has escaped entirely from the classical tradition in a way that Jericho and Delacroix never did. Somebody once asked Goethe at the end of his life the difference between classicism and romanticism, to which the poet, who was no doubt sick of the question, gave the shortest reply on record. Classicism is health, romanticism is disease. Well, if that were true, Goya's last pictures would be the climax of romanticism, for never has disgust with human life infected a mind more completely and caused a more catastrophic disease of the imagination. Romanticism wasn't based solely on fear and horror. Now, the men of the late 18th century had discovered a new belief, the belief in nature. Like most divinities, nature has two aspects, the ferocious, vengeful and destructive, and the tranquil, comforting, creative. We may call them, with reservations, the Byronic and the Wordsworthian. In painting, Jenny Coe and a great deal of Turner represents destructive nature. Comforting, health-giving nature was represented by Constable. He was born in a valley on the borders of Essex and Suffolk. Down the valley, the river Stour meanders with innumerable twists, but it had been made navigable by locks. The life of the valley was regulated by the slow movement of barges. Constable grew up in this peaceful, enclosed world. He wrote, the sound of water escaping from mill dams, willows, old rotten planks, slimy posts and brickwork. These scenes made me a painter, and I am grateful.
Beyond the banks was cultivated, productive land. He loved a good harvest and wrote, The solitude of mountains oppresses my spirit. Exactly the reverse of a standard romantic reaction. Yet, Constable is part of the romantic rebellion because of his belief in what he called the morality of nature. He felt that we are all part of a cosmic scheme and that the drama of man's life was reflected in what he called the chiaroscuro of nature. This was the belief of Wordsworth, that the humbler and simpler the form of life, the more it had retained of its divine innocence and its power to comfort and inspire us. And although uh, films of insects or of fishes don't uh, seem to support this uh, pantheistic optimism, it still has immense charm for us. All our efforts towards the conservation of nature and the avoidance of pollution, the preservation of wildlife, go back to the words Worthian view of nature and its most wholehearted interpreter, Constable. So that, for the time being, the words Worthian nature is in the ascendant. But in the early 19th century, in the art of painting at any rate, it was the Byronic nature that had the upper hand. The Byron of painting was Jericho. He gave visible form to the malaise of romanticism, the restlessness, the death wish, and the worship of ungovernable forces that fill so many pages of Byron's poems. He was not, like the poet, a world figure, but he was undoubtedly a man of genius, recognized as such from the first. And he carried through one major work into which he put the whole of himself with a completeness that Byron's child Harold never quite achieved. His great masterpiece, The Raft of the Medusa, was a record of a ghastly drama at sea. The raft had been cut adrift after a shipwreck and the 149 men on board were condemned to almost certain death. After appalling incidents, including cannibalism, a few survivors sighted a ship and were saved. Jericho interviewed them. He even got the carpenter who built the raft to reconstruct it in his studio. But in spite of all this, all this documentation, the picture is a good deal more academic than Goya's Third of May. We're aware that behind it are the examples of Michelangelo and even of Raphael's Transfiguration. And yet it is a most moving work. We feel, as Jericho intended we should, that all humanity is a raft of desperate men, surrounded by the dead and dying, but suddenly united by hope. This is a true theme of revolutionary art, the theme of Beethoven. The unity of movement and the way in which the whole rushes towards its climax is worthy of a Beethoven symphony. I don't suppose that Jericho was aware of this likeness to Beethoven because unlike David and Delacroix, who are all passionate lovers of music, he seems to have had no interests outside art except for horses. It was on this account that he took the terrible step, for a Frenchman, of visiting England. The most profound student of the horse, and to my mind one of the greatest English painters, George Stubbs, had, it is true, gone out of fashion. But Jericho knew and copied his work on the anatomy of the horse. And also those pictures in which Stubbs realizes for the first time since Rubens the fierce animal impulses which were to play such a part in Romanticism. And he must have found particularly sympathetic the series of horses attacked by lions, in which Stubbs, in spite of his disparaging remarks about antique art, has used the same kind of closely knit relief design which inspired the drawings of Jericho. Jericho learned a lot in England, and on his return to France he set about a series of pictures of lunatics. They were his last work. While still painting them, his mysterious illness developed, and after a year of suffering, he died at the age of 33. Of all the romantics who died young, he is perhaps the most incomplete. The Raft of the Medusa and the Mad Women are evidence that he was, potentially, one of the greatest romantic painters of the 19th century. Meanwhile, what had happened to classicism? 
Of course, it was still the style taught in academies and continued to be so for another century. But the heart had gone out of it. David had become court painter to Napoleon, and although he produced one really superb image of the emperor, which, as with the Mara, was almost as much a romantic as a classic picture, his time was taken up with enormous official canvases, which not only sapped his energies, but in a subtle way degraded the rigor and purity of his style. After the fall of Napoleon, he was exiled to Brussels and painted some really bad pictures. It was his brilliant pupil, Ingres, who maintained the prestige of classicism. Ingres had made his name by painting two or three pictures of unimpeachable classicism. But during the first 15 years of his creative life, his years of inspiration, he was considered a dangerous revolutionary, who was applying to classical subjects a sharp, linear, archaic style. Unlike David, he never thought that his pictures should influence conduct or moral feeling. He wanted them to achieve perfection as works of art. And he was, I believe, the first artist to whom the words art for art's sake were applied in a pejorative sense. His first great successes are his portraits. And this one of Madame Riviere, painted in 1805, remains almost his masterpiece. The drawing is more sharply accented than in his later work. He might perhaps have come to consider the arc of her shoulder as too much simplified. And, under the influence of Greek vases, the drapery is almost archaic. But on the whole, this is Ingres tel qu'il fut, as he was and as he was to remain for the next 60 years. Ingres was one of those artists to whom the outline was something sacred and magical. And the reason is that it was a means of reconciling the major conflict in his own art, the conflict between what he saw and what he knew to be there. After all, the difference between a, a total visual impression and a sheet of white paper with a few thin lines on it is very great. And yet this convention is one which mankind seems to have adopted almost instinctively at an early stage in our development. And in spite of its abstract character, the outline is responsive to the least tremor of sensibility. The portraits of Holbein said Ankh at the end of his life are above everything, or rather, recollecting himself, they are only surpassed by the portraits of Raphael. The best illustration of this theme is a portrait of Madame de Vosse, and we're fortunate in having the drawing. It shows how severely abstract was the scaffolding of his portraits. In the picture, though, every shape uh, retains its identity. For example, the compact and decisive shapes created by the necklace and the dress. Yet Ankh has managed to give a certain softness of modelling, for example, to the arm, and an expression to the head, which prevents any theoretical dryness. Monsieur Ingres forbade his friends from pronouncing the name of Raphael before his works. Compared to him, he said, I am so high bending down, no, till you almost touch the floor, no, 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 so high. And so he may feel in front of some of Ang's uh, pictures of the Madonna. But uh, when we confront Madame de Verse with one of Raphael's portraits, uh, the comparison isn't so far-fetched. Madame de Verse, like Madame Riviere, presents in a direct manner the primum mobile of Ang's art, the tension between his intellect and his senses. The connection between beauty of form and sex is extremely obscure, perhaps one of those subjects best left alone. At any rate, we can say that with Ang, it was so close as to amount almost to identity. It was only in his rapture at the sight of the female figure that Ang could realize his inner ideal of order. It is true that this ideal forced the female figure to conform to some strange rules. On the other hand, Without this particular emotion, the idea could not have come to life. Ang has succeeded in embodying his idea most perfectly in a picture called The Grande Baigneurs. It's before this picture more than any other that we are reminded of the phrase of Baudelaire, if the island of Cythera had commissioned a picture for Monsieur Ingres, 
we can be sure that it would not have been gay and playful like that of Watteau, but robust and nourishing like love in the antique world. In the Grand Peigneurs, this sensuality is achieved not only by the pose and the outline, but by the enchanting delicacy of the reflected light, which reveals the modeling of the uneventful back. This is something which Ang hardly ever permitted himself again. And we see that imprisoned within his obsession with the outline was a natural painter who could easily have taken a totally different direction. In the years that followed, several more female figures were realized, although whether they were conceived then or earlier, one can't say. One of them, I think, must have been a fresh idea, that extraordinary work known as the Grand Odalisque. There's something perverse and complicated about her, not at all like glamour antique, which suggests to me that Ange was coming to the end of his glorious response to the female body. Also, she's painted with a deliberate sharpness of colour, as if to put your teeth on edge, contemporary critics said, which twists away from the restrained, harmonious colour of 1808. She was bitterly attacked, and if Ange had died in 1814, he would have been considered the most talented, the most dangerous of the great revolutionaries. But he didn't. He lived on for another 53 years, during which time he made himself into a little god of classical orthodoxy. He painted some magnificent portraits, but his imagination failed him. His religious pictures and the manner of Raphael are academism at its most boring. This is the kind of painting that exacerbated the romantics and led to the great conflict that lasted for 40 years, the conflict between Ingres and Delacroix.